Bonnie's going to read to us from the book of Matthew. Jesus walks on water. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. So ends the reading of God's holy word for uh, allowing me to the chance to preach. Um, I've been in this role as director of ministries for about two years right now, uh, since for about the past two years, so I haven't uh, had the chance to do it as much as in the past, and so it's always a treat to, to get to get up here and share the word. And, and I also want to take this opportunity um, to, to now you kind of heard my whole life story, um, but I also want to introduce um, the, t the rest of the team that is here with me. Uh, Reverend Roger Spar in the back. Roger is is the district superintendent for the Glacial Lakes District, which this church is a part of, and he's been here this this weekend with us. And then Valerie Melmer, uh, who is uh, one of our co-district lay leaders and is a member of a church in Sioux Falls. Thank you to my assistant, lovely assistant there. <laughs> um, and then also John Sertska, who is um, a part of our uh, Equipping Missional Congregations link, and uh, that's the our, our church uh, conference committee that works with new churches as well as revitalization, and, and he's an, also a member of a church in Sioux Falls, and so they have been gracious enough to be here um, alongside of me and, and to just be blessed to listen and to learn from you, learn about how God has worked in this church over the years and, and look expectantly to how God will continue to work. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, we ask now that your Holy Spirit would come and move among us. We ask that you would open our hearts, our ears, our minds, our lives to you. Breathe into us your words of light and of grace and of truth. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So for those of you that don't know, um, we've been, uh, we're here as a part of the journey renewal process. This is something that didn't just start this weekend. This is something that your church was invited to be a part of um, back in, it was about February, I think, when we had the, the bishop's invitational gathering and to share the vision for this new pilot program. This, this first time we're doing this of coming alongside uh, churches such as yours and to learn about the things you do well, to to offer some training and equipping for your pastor and lay leaders, and then to help help you launch a new life cycle, sort of the next step that God is calling you to as a church. And I hope that you're able to stick around not just for the delicious potluck, but also we'll be doing some activities and learning some new things about what that means to launch into a new life cycle and to sort of look expectantly for God's, God's calling in your life. 
But I also, I don't want to just thank you uh, for allowing us to be here, but also for, for being um, the inaugural church, I will say. This is our first of this pilot program. This is the first visitation weekend. And I always think there's something um, kind of takes a little chutzpah and, and bold gumption to say, okay, we'll be first. And so I just appreciate your willingness to kind of step out on the water and, and be, be bold like that and to, to invite us to be here and, and to be a part of this process. The first to, to think about what God might be calling you to next and what are those God-sized possibilities. So as I was thinking about that idea of, you know, being brave and bold and, and doing the unexpected, I, I thought, what scripture, what scripture would speak to that? And, and what better to speak to bold and brave steps than this idea of walking on water? Now, if you know the stories of Scripture, you know that this is kind of how God seems to work, right? Doing unexpected, unbelievable things through just average, ordinary, everyday people. But what about us? What about us now as those people? Those average, ordinary, everyday people. What would it take for us to be the kind of people who are in tune with Jesus, who call for him to work in bold ways in our lives, and who look expectantly for those unexpected, unbelievable things to happen in our lives today. Well, I think to begin with, it would take a willingness to get out of the boat. Now, I think that um, if you move along through the, the slides there, I think I had the scripture probably in front there, and if you keep moving through there, we'll get to there just so that we make sure that, keep going there, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. There we go. Get out of the boat. Now, this seems obvious, right? If you're going to walk on water, you need to get out of the boat. I mean, I think there's even a book that's written about that. If you want to walk out on water, you have to get out of the boat. But, but I don't know about you, but it's still to me, even though it sounds obvious, it, it sounds like a pretty scary thing. And I have to wonder, had I been Peter in that boat, would I have done that? Now let's set aside the miraculous nature of this whole endeavor for a minute and think about, just think about the situation that was going on there. These guys had been, as it said in the scripture, they had been battered by the wind and the waves. They hadn't made it across, the, the wind against them was so strong, they hadn't made it across the lake the entire night. They've been struggling. I mean, it'd been, this, lake is, this lake is probably six or seven miles, and, and so if they'd been pushing against, they probably felt like they were going nowhere. And now, now they think they see a ghost. So you think about that. They're tired, they're battered, they're scared, they're stuck. And I think I have a picture in the next slide of what that looks like. A feeling like that. So have you ever felt like that? Tired, battered, scared, stuck? Felt like that in your life or your job or, or even in our church or our world sometimes? It's not exactly the place in life in which we're, we're chomping at the bit to take our biggest risks and, and do bold, wild, and crazy things. And yet, and yet if we're going to do a bold thing, to live big dreams, then we have to be willing to step out of the boat and take that first step. You know, a while back I heard a sermon illustration about that idea of taking bold, brave steps, and it, and it really stuck with me. And it was an illustration that talked about wing walking. I don't know, do you remember these guys? I mean, you hear about these, what I think are certifiably insane people that um, get out of the safety of the cockpit and then they walk across the wing of a plane, which this sounds like pure torture to me. But what was interesting in the sermon illustration, they were talking about the different frets that they would hold on to. And they said the one was about the average width of a, a man's wingspan plus a little bit more, which meant that in order for, to get from where they were holding on to, to where they needed to grab next, they had to let go for just a minute. Let go. So if we're thinking about a willingness to get out of the boat, to take that first step, maybe we need to ask ourselves, what do I need to let go of to get to where Jesus is? Is it anger or frustration from, a, from, a, from the past that keeps me from, from new life in my life now? Is it worries or anxieties about what if that keep me from enjoying what is? Is it an unhealthy fear of scarcity that paralyzes us from moving forward? Or, 
Or is it something deeper? The reality is, is I think we all have things in our lives that we need to let go of. We may even need to let go of comfort or, or control or even simply the familiarity of a boat and to risk that vulnerability of leaving behind the vessel in order to be able to walk on water. Of course, that also means we have to let go of our fear of failing, falling, or looking foolish. Now, one of my favorite quotes comes from President Theodore Roosevelt. And the quote is entitled, the man, it's from a thing entitled, The Man in the Arena. So and maybe you're familiar with this, but if, I, if not, I want to read it to you. It says, it's not the critic that counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena whose face is marred by sweat and blood and dust, who strives valiantly, who errs, and who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, great devotion, who spends himself on a worthy cause, who at the best in the end knows the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, well, at least he fails while daring greatly. So his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. You know, I often, I often think that Peter gets a bad rap in this scripture sometimes because he faltered, right? He starts to sink and has to cry out for help. But the truth is, he's the only one who got out of the boat, right? He's the only one who was brave enough to put himself out there. Now, I don't know if the possibility of falling crossed his mind before he stepped out of the boat or if he was just brave enough to set it aside. I mean, did he think, what if this doesn't work? What are the guys going to think of me? And who am I to think I could even do this? Or did it all happen so fast he didn't have time to think? And with Peter, that's usually how life went. But regardless of how it was for him, we know in our lives when we're feeling that nudge to, to step into the arena, to step out of the boat, to be brave and bold, we often do have time to think, and we do think these things. In fact, I think they most frequently come up when we begin to think about God-sized dreams for ourselves or our families or our congregation and faith requiring risks. We start thinking of why this won't work or why other people will judge us, and suddenly our fear of failing or falling or looking foolish becomes a tactic that the enemy uses to, uses to stop us from risking, from courageously stepping out onto the water. But it is in these times, these times when we have the chance to step out of the water that we need to not just hear the encouraging words of Teddy Roosevelt, but more importantly, we need the words from Jesus himself. We need words he gave us like, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart for I have overcome the world. Or to hear him say, you didn't choose me, I chose you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And I think we even need the words he spoke to Peter as he was sinking. You see, I believe when Jesus said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? It wasn't this condemning, belittling, why did you doubt kind of measure, you didn't measure up thing. I think the message he was giving is, why did you doubt that you could do this when, when I said, come to me? Why? Why, didn't you, why did you forget that you can trust me? You can trust that I am able to do things in and through your life that don't add up or seem possible or logical. You can trust me and believe in my power, my power to do the great things through you and know my great love for you. But we know this can be hard to remember in life, right? And rather than hearing that voice of truth that we sang about, we hear shaming message. Don't drop the ball. Don't fall short. Don't mess up. And we believe this idea, reality or not, that we're, we're constantly being judged and so we hold back. Or worse yet, we turn on each other when we're nervous or scared or uncertain. But if we are going to be bold followers of Jesus, then we have to be brave enough to step out of the boat, even if it ends, means we end up splashing around for a little while. Beyond that, this world needs us as the church to be places of compassion and connection that encourage others to step out in faith in their own lives as well. 
We need to be places where people can take risks, risks like standing up here and bravely telling their story of how God has worked in their life or sharing a talent. Or where people can take the risk of, of leading a small group or team even when they don't feel like they have no enough or have what it takes. Or, or where people can risk speaking honestly about their struggles and brokenness and know that they will be received with eyes and words of love and encouragement. We need to be people who together risk reaching into the messy parts of our world and our neighborhoods to bring light and hope. And we need to be people who speak the truth in love, who seek the truth in love, and believe that redemption and resurrection are available to all, even if they are sinking or splashing or sailing. But ultimately, I don't think we can be those places. We can't be that people. We can't walk on water if we don't first ask to be called. You know, when, when you accepted this invitation to be a part of the, the journey renewal process, you started to pray for the Holy Spirit to break through in your midst. You were asking to be called. You see, that's why we start this whole process with prayer, with asking for God to break through and do unexpected things in our midst. It's why prayer has to undergird it all, because it's that spark that ignites bold, risk-taking, dream-fulfilling power of God in our lives. And it is the step of opening ourselves up for God to call us, to call us out onto the water, to call us out to where he is. See, I believe that Jesus does still want each of us to walk on water. I mean, think about it. Jesus said to his disciples, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. What? I mean, do you hear that? Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying, you're going to do even greater things than me. This is impossible, right? I mean, this seems impossible on our human terms and with our abilities and determination. But you see, God's plan for is a world full of, of little Christ. People who are seeking to be like Jesus, to, to multiply that, who are tapped into the Holy Spirit. And, and that is greater than just Jesus on his own. He knew as we multiplied his love and his light, it would be greater. And that's not just a plan that's lived out within the four walls of a church to whoever happens to come in. It's meant to be lived out out there. You see, this isn't the church. You are the church. We are the church. We are the living, breathing body of Christ. These greater things are seen when we pray, when we ask God to call us to do crazy things like walk on water, to give us the courage to dream big and live boldly and courageously in our families, in our homes, in our schools, in our neighborhoods and workplaces, and in our world. Friends, God wants to do big things in and through us, things that don't reveal our talent or our goodness, but things that reveal his power that can only be done because of him. Things that show his greatness and his love for his people. And because we believe that at the core of our being, we pray these dreams even when logic says it would take a miracle. We pray these dreams even when we don't see immediate results. And we pray these dreams because it is through our bold, constant, committed prayer that God will plant these dreams in our heart and bring them to blossom. So may that be our bold challenge as the ark, as United Methodists, as followers of Jesus in this world to keep praying for God's call and God's dream to set aside our fears and take that first step out of the boat and to know the thrill of walking on water to the one who is out there waiting for us. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we hear these words that you gave to your disciples. These words to call, to come and to follow. These words that, that we could do greater things and it does seem impossible. And Lord, we confess that our human nature, we get in the way. We're sorry, God. We, we get in the way with our own fears, our own biases or preferences, our own personal struggles, and we forget, we forget 
that you're still calling us to walk on water and to lead others to do the same. So remind us, Lord. Remind us when we worship. Remind us when we walk through our day and we see glimpses of you. Remind us even, even when the waves and the wind are battering us. Remind us, God, that you are still at work. And so we will continue to pray boldly for you to break into our lives and invite us out onto that water with you. For we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.